diversity between the sexes. Male and female humans possess unique differences. This is a scientific fact. As is commonly known, men have a Y chromosome and females do not, and men possess only one X chromosome. This difference results in various ribosomal proteins to encode differently in men and women, which results in widespread biochemical differences between men and women. Men and women also possess organs the other does not, and consequently, some aspects of the nervous system are different. There are also variations of instincts between male and female humans that are hardwired behaviors. While it is possible for a person to adopt what is more instinctive to the other gender as culture, when it is adopted as culture it is not the same as instinct. Instincts can of course be resisted to some degree, varying with the factors of the situation, and with learning, which is what moral instruction is for, but instincts are such driving forces in a species that they cannot be erased through willpower alone, they can only be guided toward certain directions. Consequently, on the topic of diversity between human sexes, there is more genetic difference between a man who is considered Caucasian descent and a woman who is considered Caucasian descent than that man has with a man who is considered of African descent. This is a scientific fact. Yet during my time many people refused to acknowledge or accept this for purely ideological reasons, believing that if they deny reality they can somehow create equality between men and women socially. This is unfortunate because this ideology does not make them happier or live a better life, it only brings them into conflict whenever the realities of the differences between men and women step into view. The feminist narrative that is popular in my time is the misguided idea that men have specifically been trying to oppress women and denying them opportunities to do much else but be caretakers of the home and raising children. The reality is that for most of human history the majority of people, both male and female, were part of social classes that restricted their opportunities in life to ensure a stable civilization. For 5,000 years the only way to increase social class within these systems was through achievements, many of which were militarily oriented. As combat was done with melee weapons for most of human history and women are at a disadvantage to men in physical prowess due to the physiological differences between the genders, women rarely acquired these kinds of achievements. Furthermore, most work was of a laborious quality, much of which had to be performed by people who might have been malnourished at times. Men have advantages when it comes to functioning with diminished rest and while malnourished which women do not, and consequently men primarily did laborious work and women focused on raising children and maintaining the home. This partnership between men and women was not oppressive, as this cooperation resulted in lifelong relationships that allowed humans to survive a difficult life of hardships. Many generations of humans persisted under this social dynamic between men and women, and it resulted in human civilizations eventually developing to the technological level of the present age, where our machinery has made many jobs more accessible to women. This has given women opportunities that even many of their male ancestors did not have opportunities for, yet many women today do not understand this because they do not think about history in a holistic way, instead, they slice off pieces of it to conform to a narrative of an imagined conspiracy that all of their ancestral men had against all of their female ancestors. They look at the history of humanity in a way that lacks proper context for the lives our ancestors lived, and they apply postmodernist relativist ideas to the analysis of their ancestors' lives. Many of these new ideas, by the way, have not been demonstrated to actually make women or men more happy in life as compared to the more traditional structures that have persisted for thousands of years. People who reject the idea that men and women are necessary for the benefit of both and who subscribe to the idea that gender roles are not necessary for our species to persist have adopted a delusion. Their ideologies lead to misfortune for the civilizations where this needless animosity fosters. A stable civilization requires stable home life for children, so that they are raised to be well educated and emotionally stable, prepared to inherit the responsibilities of the previous generation and push humanity forward another step. Traditional gender roles have reflected the biological reality of humans and how we develop from infants to adults. 
The human species consists of men and women who are the counterpart of the other half. Ideologies cannot change this, and while base instincts do not always suit us in the modern societies we have built, they are not without purpose. Men and women who conform to traditional gender roles of husband and wife tend to be more content in their lives than individuals who do not. They raise children who are better prepared to function as adults and themselves become good parents to their own offspring. Many people forget that the human species has been around for at least 200,000 years, and our evolution as a species with unique gender roles reflects the life our most distant ancestors live, our biology was not designed to reflect the kind of lives we live today. If we were to strip away all of the technological advantages present-day humans have been afforded by science, men and women would again need to conform to the same social roles to survive the harsh environments of this planet. As such, it is important to understand and remember why humans have evolved the way that we are, and the reasons for why there are two genders in the human species, to suggest the best way to raise children is in a family unit that has only men or only women is preposterous. Humans are not an asexual species and using our scientific knowledge in an effort to remove the necessity of one gender and a family structure, as many postmodern feminists seek to do, is a distraction from the optimal way for humans as a species to survive. People should take care to not allow their sexual lust to dictate how to live their lives nor base their personal identity largely around their sexual fetishes, to do so is not relativism, it is merely hedonism by another name. Much like the drive to eat, sex is an act that our biology drives us to do because these are acts necessary for the survival of our species, but it must be done with consideration. Moderation has to be practiced with all things, and this also applies to sex. It is okay to enjoy things like eating and sex, it is not okay to enjoy it to the degree it becomes the most important thing in your life above all else. The reality is that human procreation determines necessary gender roles for a functional human being and social structure for that human being. A woman is born with all of the eggs she will use during her lifetime and without intervention using hormonal drugs, she will hit menopause after depleting her eggs reserve. A woman is born with all of the eggs she is intended to use during her lifetime, and the genetic information of these eggs comes from her mother and father. New mutations from the father are inherited by the child, yes, but she does not pass on to her children any new mutations she may gain during her lifetime. Only men pass on their gene mutations to the children, which is one of the reasons why testosterone makes effort feel so good to men to encourage men to subject themselves to a strenuous life and overcome trials and hardships that they trigger new helpful mutations which can be passed to future children. It is the responsibility of men to subject themselves to a strenuous life and develop useful mutations to pass on to their children, and for women to make themselves a suitable host for incubating new children by practicing good nutritional and other habits throughout their young lives. Women need not preoccupy themselves with developing new useful mutations to pass on to children, because generally they will not if they use the eggs they were born with. They do, however, need to be healthy and part of being healthy is practicing good nutritional habits, especially during pregnancy because nutritional quality will impact the gene expression of the resulting offspring. There are people who will disagree with what I have said. And they may point out that with modern science and injectable hormones it is possible for a post-menopause woman to produce new eggs and that is true, but it is not a thing that can naturally occur without medical intervention, and that is the point here. It is not intended by our genetics for women to pass on such mutations and arguably, one of the contributing factors to why children born to post-menopause women using these fertility treatments have a high degree of birth defect related problems is because of bad gene mutations passed on to the children by mothers who otherwise wouldn't have passed these bad mutations on if they had instead mothered children in their younger years. While men can also pass on poor mutations too, when a woman selects a mate that is a naturally healthy strong and intelligent male as a mate this is unlikely to occur as the mechanism of sperm's competition for fertilization of eggs is designed to weed out bad mutations. This is part of the process of natural selection in the human species that has been practiced for 200,000 years.
It is a good method for producing new members of our species, this is why we have persisted to the present day and accomplished all of the things that we have. It is my opinion that many of the health defect problems that are becoming commonplace among humans in civilized western societies in my time are a consequence of poor mate selection, romantic relationships and procreation practiced by many people diverting from our natural intended evolutionary behavior that humans have practiced for millennia. Like the story of Daedalus and Icarus, too many parents believe that novel technologies can free themselves and their offspring from the labyrinth of life's realities, but like Icarus, they simply doom their children to fall into depravity and self-created misfortunes when the wings of technology melt in the sun of reality. Technology has its limits and must be used correctly to produce beneficial results, and the correct way to use any technology is only discoverable after reflecting on human evolutionary behavior and understanding how we became modern humans. Our instincts are not useless but not all-powerful, it takes wisdom to employ technology and guide instincts appropriately. Yet. Believing you can completely overwrite innate human instinctive predispositions with novel ideas is delusional. Ignore my warnings at your own peril, using technology and science to coddle a delusion never ends well for anybody. Doing so has a history of leading to atrocities that were avoidable. There are two genders in the human species for a legitimate reason. They both have their necessary role to play in the species and that includes their influence in rearing healthy, well-adjusted children who ultimately must become adults and assume their own role in parenting for the species to successfully persist. Diverting from this path leads to ruin.